uh, this morning we're going to finish up with the Ten Commandments. So we've been kind of sporadic when we've been doing them, sometimes Sunday morning, sometimes Sunday night. But I want to finish with covering the Ten Commandments. And so we are at number 10. And look at Exodus chapter 20 and verse 17. It says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Right there, number 10, thou shalt not covet. We should not have a be lusting after and having a desire for things that belong to someone else. Things that we can't have, okay? Now, it's one thing, you know, we're... You're not going to be able to help if you're driving by a car dealership and you see that car out there that you would really like. You know, if you see that and you want it, that's not necessarily coveting because the truth is you could have it if you'd go buy it, right? Or, you know, if somebody's got something for sale, maybe you see a nice house that's for sale and you look at that and think, man, I would love that house. You're not necessarily coveting because you could have that if you coughed up the money, if you bought it. But when you are trying to get things that in a way that's just not right. Something that you should not have. You know, for even even my house. If you look at my house and you're like, man, I would love to have your house. Well, make me an offer, you know, and but okay. But there are some things that you can't have. Okay. For example, it mentions the wife. Okay. If you want my wife, too bad. All right. That that's off limits. You know, that cannot be attained uh, honestly. You cannot you cannot have that. There are some things that they do, they, they belong to someone else, and yet you can't have them. And we shouldn't even desire those things. We should, and if it's something too that it's just not possible for you to obtain, okay? You know, don't go, you know, desiring and lusting after those things, okay? Obviously, there are some houses, I've seen many houses that are for sale that I would like, but I'm not going to go drooling over it because I know I'm never going to have the kind of money that it's going to take to have that. And so it'd be pointless for me to sit around you know, lusting and desiring that. And it's, but it's covetousness, covetousness is really bad when we start doing things, you know, immoral and so, uh, and things that are unethical to try to attain things that are not ours. And so kind of in this message, I've got like a long introduction and then there's really kind of a short message, but first off, just some things about covetousness, things that we need to understand is covetousness is not just desiring something that's not yours. Yes. That's true too. And that especially happens too when you're coveting after someone's wife and you get her and then you're like, yeah, she wasn't what I thought. And it's like, <laughs> that's why you want God's blessing. And so, yeah, don't go coveting after things. But that is, that is, that's absolutely true. Because in Satan, he tricks us with these things. I'm going to show you two later how. Christians are being deceived by covetousness and how they're getting themselves in a lot of trouble. So, you know, it's, it's not just desiring something that's not yours, but it's desiring something that you're just not supposed to have. In Joshua chapter seven, we see there's a famous story of Achan who took of the accursed thing. When, after they defeated Jericho, all the spoils that they got from that battle, those belong to the Lord. God said, those are mine. You, whatever you get from that battle, you do not keep those belong to me. But Achan in Joshua chapter 7, verse 20, he had taken of the accursed thing. He took some things that they were cursed. They weren't cursed because they were just like evil things. They were cursed because these didn't belong to them. It belonged to God. And it's the same thing too. You know, when you hold back, you know, what's, you know, when you hold back the tithe, I believe that part of your money is cursed. That belongs, that belongs to the Lord. I believe, I still believe that. In the New Testament era, I'm not going to preach that again. But in Joshua chapter 7, verse 20, it says, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold and 50, of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under them. And it did. It brought a curse on his family. It brought a curse on Israel. Many people died. Achan and his entire family ended up dying because of this. But he did. He saw these things that he desired. Sometimes we're going to see things that we desire, but if they're not ours to have, and we're looking at those things and desiring them, that is coveting. 
and it will bring a curse in your life. It will bring, it'll bring destruction. And so we need to understand there are some things that are out there that, yes, those could be yours. And if you want to work for those things, if you want to save for those things, you know, your, your wife, you can try using the 10th commandment to keep her from shopping, but it's not coveting when you go shopping. All those things could be yours if you'll just cough up the money, okay? That's not, necess- that's not necessarily a sin going shopping, but there are, there are some things. We can't have that. That's off limits to us. That's off limit to you as an individual. Maybe it's off, some things that are off limit to us as a Christians. And for us to look at those things and desire those things, it's coveting. But at the same time, there are some things that we see. There's really just one book of the Bible where we see that it is appropriate to covet after. And look what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And verse 29, and I think this is interesting because it uses the word covet and everywhere else in the Bible, coveting is always a bad thing. But it says in first Corinthians 12, 29, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Talking about the gifts of the spirit of God. And the gifts of the Spirit of God are to be used in the church of God. They're to be used for the work of the Lord. They're supposed to be used for other people. And the Bible says it's appropriate to covet after the best gifts. But notice when it comes to spiritual gifts, we don't use these things for our benefit. We use them to be a blessing to other people. And so if you want to covet after that, that's fine because that's not a selfish coveting. And it says also in chapter 14 and verse 39, Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy. And forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently in order. Talking about prophesying or preaching. If you have a desire to do that, there's nothing wrong with that because that's a blessing to other people. You can be a help to other people. But coveting, we see in the Bible when it's bad, and it's almost every time you see it, people are desiring things because I want this for me. It's all about me. I want that item. I want that thing. I want it so I can fulfill my lust. And that's when coveting is a sin. And the only time you'll see good coveting, it's in one book of the Bible, and it's talking about desiring to have gifts that can be used for other people. That's not a selfish coveting. But most of ours is. And so we see that lust too, okay? You know, coveting, it's lusting after something. And the Bible says too in Romans 7, 7, what shall we say then is the law of sin? God forbid, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law... For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. Okay? Lusting is something that we all struggle with. Okay? You can, there's, and there's lots of things we can lust after. Our flesh, it desires certain things. It's, it's going to lust. It's going to be attracted to things. Some of those things are good. Some of those things are bad. How do we know? Well, we know by the law of God. The law taught us about coveting. The law taught us about lust. The things that we shouldn't want to have, but yet at the same time, okay, is it a sin? Now, if you know any of us in here, most of us in here probably, if you saw a nice juicy T-bone steak smothered in onions with A1 sauce, you're going to lust, aren't you? I mean, you're going to start drooling over that thing. Now, is that a sin? Okay, no, because you know you can have that, all right, unless it's my steak, you know. But uh, but at the same time. Listen, even if it is my steak, if you see that, you're going to desire that unless you're a vegetarian or something. You're you're going to you're going to want you're going to want that. But when it's a sin, it's when you start, you know, when you're plotting, how can I get that from him? You know, how can I get him distracted? uh, You know, so I can take that and I can have that, you know, I can have that particular steak. Listen, there's some things, you know, that, that. you know, our lusts that aren't necessarily a bad thing. You know, the Bible talked about when they would go into the land, you know, that they would, you know, uh, God was going to give them food and they would have these feasts and they could have whatever their soul lusted after. Okay, you know, referring to food. Okay, we all lust after food. Okay, there's some lust that's not bad. It's okay to lust after your, your wife. If you want to lust after your wife, nothing wrong with that. I think that's appropriate. That's fine. You're just not supposed to lust after someone else's wife. Okay, and when it lust becomes covetousness it's when you are lusting after things that are not yours things that you cannot have things that you should not have and god hates the covetous it says in psalms 10 3 for the wicked boasteth 
of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. Now that's a strong word there to abhor something. I mean, that's just to hate something, to detest something. And God abhors the covetous. And it's talking about, you know, the wicked. They're boasting of their heart's desire. They'll bless the covet, the covetous. They'll say good things about that person, but God hates that person that is coveting that person to, who will do things in an unjust way to obtain things that he should not have things that belong to others. And we, and, uh, and, uh, turn over to Exodus chapter 18, something interesting about this and see all these things, just kind of facts about covetousness to help us understand it. But in Exodus chapter 18, verse 19, this is after they've come out of Egypt, Moses, he's judging all the people and he's dealing with everybody's problems and it was too much for him. And his father-in-law comes along and he tells him, Hey, you're taking too much on yourself. You need to appoint some judges. You need to have some judges that can make these smaller decisions. And then you just deal with the bigger decisions. He's teaching them how to delegate a little bit here, a good thing. But in verse 19 he says, hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to God word that thou mayest bring the causes unto God and thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people, able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds rulers of fifties and rulers of 10 and let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself and they shall bear the burden with thee. He said, when you have judges, you need men that hate covetousness. Why is that so important for a judge? Because a lot of the problems that people have in society is people trying to get what belongs to somebody else. <laughs> Isn't that what's happening you know, in most lawsuits? Somebody thinks, you know what? I deserve this person's possession. I deserve their money. They have this that belongs to me. And there's a dispute. And if you're going to have a judge, if you're going to be making decisions in those, you need to have someone who hates covetousness. Someone who hates a person that would try to take what belongs to someone else. Now listen, we live in America, folks. In America... We don't really have anything. Everything kind of belongs to the government. You know, I was listening to a message I preached the other day. Whenever I say this is America, usually what's about to say, I'm about to say is bad. <laughs> but we, we've, got a lot of, we've got a lot of goofed up laws in this country. But you know what? There was a time when land, it belonged to someone. That was their land. It belonged to them. Now we don't have that. Now we have sales tax, or not sales tax, you know, property tax that we have to pay forever. Why? Because land is not ours. You know, we can't have our own rules and our own laws and our own land. You know, we've got to go with the laws that everybody does. I mean, we have a federal government that can make laws. You know, they can make one law to fit the entire country. How is that fair? In a country of over 300 million people, as large as this country is, how is it that we can have just nine judges make decisions for 300 million people. Folks, we ought to have a huge problem with that. And the thing is, when it comes to this country, a lot of our laws that we have, when you start, when it comes right down to it, nothing really belongs to us, does it? N nothing. You know, Walmart, they have their stuff, but yet if I'm going to go purchase it from them, I got to give extra money too to the state. You know, why are they, why, you know, this, these sales tax, some states don't have sales tax. You know, why in the world do they have, you know, right to all of these things and they can just, they can force these things on people. I understand some taxes. I do. I understand some of it, but I'm telling you, it's completely out of control because we have totally lost the whole concept in this country that there are things that belong to people. And for example, your children, they belong to you. They are your children, okay? I personally, I dis completely disagree with this anchor baby stuff, all right? Where if people come into this country illegally and they have a child in this country, well, that child is an American citizen. Well, here's the problem with that, okay? The country shouldn't own people. Okay? That child belongs to the parents. And if the parents aren't citizens, then why is the child a citizen? Well, they were born here. 
It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter where you were born. You belong to the parents. That's, that's the way I believe it is and the way I believe it should be. You know, and, you know, and the whole you know, immigration stuff, I think a lot of our laws are messed up on that. But at the same time, one of the reasons we have some of the goofy laws we do in that area is because we have this concept that because somebody was born in this country, our country somehow has ownership of that person. And they prove that by social security numbers and all that. I, I, I don't want to get into that. That's another subject. But we don't, we don't realize there, things belong to people. Okay, My wife belongs to me. And I belong to her. And what God had joined together, let not man put us under. I think it's sick the way we have these you know, divorce courts and divorce lawyers and judges that uh, you know, are deciding all these things for people. It's just It's not fair. It's not right, and it's messed up. And a judge should be someone who hates covetousness. Someone who would go and try to take what belongs to someone else is wicked, and we need people make that, who make decisions in those to be someone who just hates that. And it's hard to find that because our thinking is so wrong in this country. But Proverbs 28, 16 says, The prince that wanteth understanding is also a great, a, a great oppressor. And to want something means to be lacking. He's a great oppressor. But he that hateth covetousness shall prolong his days. You know, many leaders, many rulers, they see everything in the country as belonging to them. Samuel warned Israel when they wanted a king, they're like, listen, he's going to take what you have. He's going to take your sons for himself to fight his battles. And we see that all the time in, in governments and nations and rulers they see everything as belonging to them. Hey, we need your property for something. We're going to take it. We have laws like that in this country. We have eminent domain in this country where the government can come along and say, you know, we need your property. You know, it would benefit the community if we took your land and they can just, they can take it. And I think that's wrong. How did that happen? Nine people decided that. Nine people made that decision about eminent domain. Nine people did that. Nine people, a combination of Catholics and Jews made that decision. And now they can do that. They can do that anywhere. How is that fair? How is that right? Well, this is America. <laughs> that, that, that's, that's how that happens. And we do. They obviously didn't hate covetousness. Those judges should have got, been, been up there and said, what in the world? Why would we allow a government to go and take someone's land? Because they don't see that as belonging to someone. They believe it is belonging to the government. It's belonging to them. How did they get it? Other bad judges, you know, and bad leaders making these laws to take things away from people. And I say all this to say that there are, there are things that do. They belong to people. You know, I do believe it's your money, not the government's money. I, I get so angry every time I hear a politician say, you know, that they gave a tax cut. You know, they'll talk about how, you know, we, we gave a tax cut in this area. And it's like, wait a minute. And, and the, what, what they call tax cuts many times is, I'm trying, I, I, I want I, the word is escaping me that they use. But it's like when they just start, uh, yeah, it's like, yeah, they, they do, all they're doing is like changing the wording or they'll get rid of something and they'll act like that's a tax cut. And it's like, no, you're still taking my money. You know, you're, you're, you're still taking just as much as you were before, but because you're now using that money somewhere else, you're acting like I got a tax cut. You know, that, that's absolutely ridiculous. You know, because you're letting me keep, you know, more of my money, you know, I'm now not being, you know, it's just, it's so weird and it's confusing. And unfortunately we just, we don't even care about it anymore, but we should, we should hate covetousness. People who would t try to take what doesn't belong to us, but they do. They think a lot of these things are tax cuts because they see everything we have as belonging to them. And that's not the case, but we see in the Bible too, a pastor shouldn't be covetousness, uh, covetous. First Timothy three three says, "Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous." Okay, a pastor shouldn't be that way. 
wanting things that don't belong to him. Trying to take things from people that they shouldn't have. There are preachers out there that they will. They'll twist scriptures and they'll use things and they manipulate people and they take advantage of people. Why? Because they want maybe something they have. They want, they want their money and you know, they want their possessions and they do. They take advantage and a pastor ought to be someone who hates that, who doesn't want to have anything to do with that. Turn over to Proverbs chapter 21. So just, these are just kind of interesting facts about covetousness. But, you know, lazy people struggle with covetousness. Big time. If you're a lazy person, you will struggle with this sin more than the hardworking people. A lot of times we look at the rich people that, you know, that are hardworking and we see them as the covetous. And sometimes they are. But I think lazy people struggle even more. It says in Proverbs 21, 25, the desire of the slothful killeth him for his hands refuse to labor. He coveteth greedily all the day long, but the righteous giveth and spareth not. Now, how, how does they make, how does that make sense? Okay. You know that why does the poor person or the, why or the lazy person, why do they struggle with uh, with coveting more than someone else. Why is it that they're, you know, they covet greedily all the day long? Well, see, those who work hard, even if they're poor, they don't struggle with coveting as much because they have a better understanding of how certain things are waste. And therefore, it takes away their desire for foolishness. Okay, that person who's lazy, who doesn't work for anything they have, Okay, they they're you know they, first of all they have a lot more time to sit around watching TV and getting you know sucked into commercials and stuff, but they are they sit around all day, you know on social media watching what everybody else is doing, and they think I want to do that too. But a person who is working for what they have, they understand how some things are a waste. For so you know for example, a lot of people who don't have jobs, a lot of people who are on welfare. Somehow still buy lottery tickets, somehow still buy cigarettes, they still buy alcohol. How do they do that? Why would they do that? Most of us in here that work hard, we would never waste our money on stuff like that. We would not throw our money away with a lottery ticket. You know why? Because we understand the value of a dollar. We understand how hard a person has to work to be able to attain that money. And so we're not going to throw it away on foolishness. We're not going to throw it away on things that would, uh, you know, hamper our ability to work, you know, like smoking and drinking. Those things are going to make it harder for you to do those things. But the lazy, they don't understand the value of a dollar. They don't understand the amount of work it takes to get some of those things. And so they do. They, they're, it's like, they think I've got to have what everybody else has. They see other people out smoking, drinking, gambling, whatever. I ought to be able to do that too. They see everybody, you know, driving in cars, going on vacations, doing a lot of the things that hardworking people do, and they want to do those things too. They've got this mentality, I should be able to do what everyone else is doing. But a person who works hard, they understand that a lot of those things that other people are doing just aren't worth it. While some of those things might be fun, they might be enjoyable, they understand that, you know what, I have to work too hard for that money, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go, you know, spend a whole bunch of money. I don't even know how much it costs to go to the movie theater and watch a movie. But you know what? I've got, there's eight of us in our family. I'm not going to go spend whatever it's going to cost to go watch a movie that I can go and just wait a little while and I can spend 10 bucks and get a DVD and watch it in my house you know, in the privacy of my own home and not be around a bunch of, you know, other people. And, but, they, you know, to me, that's just such a big waste of money. And I'm not going to do that. I'm not, I'm not going to waste my money on things like that. But yet it's, it's the, many times the poor people who are the first ones doing all those things. You know, when you go to the carnivals and stuff, I mean, how, I mean, you know how expensive those things are? And it's like, I go there and I remember in LaSalle, you know, we, we had a bus route and we, you know, we did a lot of work in the housing area there and, you know, everybody was on welfare. And if you go to some of those carnivals and things, I would see all the, all the bus kids there. And I'd be looking at the prices and some of these things. I was like, I can't afford this. How are you, how are they, I don't understand how they all get the money to do those things. 
And then you go and then you see some of these rides and how much it costs to ride. It's like, that is a huge waste of money. I don't feel like spending that much money so I can go throw up. You know, that, that just seems like a waste. But yet, those carnivals and things, I, I hate the stereotype and stuff, but it's full of those people. How do they, how do, they do that? You know, they're just... They think that's what you're supposed to do. They covet it. They find some way to do it. I, I, don't, I don't know. They bum the money off people. I don't know if some charitable organization is giving them free tickets. I don't, but you know what? Either way, it's costing somebody money for them to do these things. And they are, they're doing these wasteful things. Feel completely entitled to it. And listen, people, you know, I, I, I hate to sound, I, I'm 100% for charity and stuff. But you know what? It's just getting out of control in this country. Okay, where I work, they're doing this big, huge backpack drive. Okay, because we got to make sure all the kids have backpacks when they go back to school. And we're going to fill them full of back to school supplies and everything. And they made a huge deal about how what a need this is. And how many kids that came and they got backpacks last year and they weren't able to give them to everyone because they just didn't have enough. And I'm like, so we have that many orphans in this community? Where are their parents? And have you ever gone to Walmart when they start putting out all the back to school stuff? You know how cheap that stuff is? You can get notebooks for like 20 cents. And it's, and then, and it, I mean, I guess hundreds of kids come to these things, just, ah, you know, just grabbing all this stuff up. And it's just like, you know, whatever happened to us taking care of ours? You know, whatever happened to us providing for our own? But, everybody, but we are raising up a generation of people that feel entitled to what everyone else has. And they're not doing any work for it. And they sit around lazy, just coveting after things. And it, the, the covetousness of that slothful person, it killeth them. Because their hands refuse to labor. You know, and, and these same people, you know, you got these millennial types that just can't ever do anything on their own. They've never accomplished anything in their life. They all got trophies for doing nothing. And then they grow up and they go into the real world and they've never, they've never achieved anything. They've never, they've never overcome anything. They've never had to work hard for anything. And they just don't know what to do. They don't know how to function. And they find out it's very unfulfilling being lazy. It's very unfulfilling not doing anything, not achieving anything. And so they, what do they do? They sit around desiring and that, that covetousness, it killeth them. And in today's day, we would say that stresses us out. It brings us mental anxiety. And so what do we do? Go get a prescription. And you got all these young people in their 20s that are all doped up already on all these drugs. What's their problem? They're crazy from just sitting around coveting after things because they're lazy. They refuse to labor and you've got people out there that, I mean, they work their behinds off every day. I mean, they work hard. They sweat and they are accomplishing things and they're fine. They don't need drugs. Yeah, we've, you know, they've got their challenges. Things are hard. Some of us, we get sore backs. You know, we're in pain after a long day of work. But you know what? We can sleep good at night because we actually accomplished something. We actually did something we're not out there trying to get what belongs to somebody else. And they do. They got all these millennials. They're the ones that during the election season, they get them out protesting, you know, protesting the rich. You know, we got it. We got to take from the rich and give to us. We've got to spread the wealth. What does that mean? Spread the wealth. Take from someone else and give to me. That is called covetousness. And we ought to hate that. We ought to be against that. Our judges should hate that. Our politicians should hate that. But they promote this spread the wealth. Take from someone else and give to somebody else. Listen, no. If those people earn that money, it's theirs. It belongs to them. Let them do what they want to with it. That It's theirs. They have, they have a right to those things. I don't have a right to any of your stuff if I'm not doing anything. So if I'm working for you, if you know, that's, that's another thing. But listen, if, I, if, if it's yours, it's yours. And we need to get back to that mentality. But so look at Mark chapter seven, verse 18. But there are some sins that literally physically defile us as people and covetousness is one of them. Turn over to Mark chapter seven and verse 18. A lot of times, you know, 
In the Old Testament, they had a lot of dietary restrictions that God had, had given them in the law. And many times people do. They, you know, There's people that are trying to bring this back. you got these Judaizers that are wanting to add some of these dietary laws. Hebrew roots people saying you shouldn't eat pork and stuff like that. But the truth is, you know what? Whatever you eat, it's fine. It's, you know, we, we bless it. It's, it's sanctified by prayer. And so, but look what it says in verse 18. It says, And he saith unto them, Are you so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him? Okay? What you eat, it doesn't defile you. Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth into the drought, purging all meats. And he said, That which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a man. Well, that's saying here, you know, many times people say, you know, that like, I don't believe personally that taking a drink of alcohol is what defiles a person. It's what a person does under the influence of that alcohol that defiles them. The Bible said whatever comes from without, it doesn't defile. If you shoot yourself up with some kind of drugs, if you're smoking dope or whatever, you're not defiling yourself because of those things. But what you do many times under the influence of those things, that's what defiles you. Because things like alcohol and drugs, they take away a lot of our inhibitions. And it, it makes it more likely what's in our heart to come out in our body. And that is what defiles us. And when a per and it mentions all these sins there, these things come from within the heart. And those defile us. And covetousness is one of those things. They will defile you. They will destroy you, destroy you. They will ruin you as a person. They will ruin you physically. You can be one of those people that you're going to be struggling with depression and have to get on drugs and stuff because you're so down and you're so depressed because you're sitting around, you're coveting after things that belong to other people. It does. It destroys people. It makes people miserable. And when we give ourselves over to covetousness, it will literally change who we are as a person. It, it, it will affect us in ways you can't imagine. Covetousness, it can make a peaceful person violent. Whatever I got to do to get it. A lot of wars that we've had in the past has been because of covetousness. People wanted things. A lot, a lot of conflict. It's been because of covetousness. But Micah chapter 2, verse 1 says, Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. When the morning is light, they practice it because it is in the power of their hand. And they covet fields and take them by violence and houses and take them away. So they oppress a man in his house, even a man and his heritage. It causes them to be violent because they covet after something. Kind of like the story of Ahab. Remember the story of Ahab and Naboth? He had that vineyard that Ahab wanted it. But Naboth said, no, this is mine. But wait a minute. Ahab was the king. He's the king of Israel. Shouldn't he have been able to take that land? Well, if it would have been America and their laws. But no, that was Israel. And that land was a part of his heritage. That was, it had been in his family for generations. It was his. And Naboth said, no, this is off limits. He tried to buy it. It was fair, right? He was trying to buy it. But no, this was something that wasn't for sale. Naboth said, you can't have it. And so what did they do? Jezebel got involved. She came up with this big plot and they had Naboth murdered and he took his field. And you know what? Ahab ended up dying because of that later when he, when he uh, was killed. It was because of that sin that he had done with Naboth. God was very upset with Ahab for what he did. And people all the time throughout history have done some very, very violent things because they wanted something that belonged to somebody else. I heard a story of a pastor of a church that a pastor in a church was coveting another man's wife, a deacon's wife in that church. And as the story, the story goes, he ended up killing that deacon and nobody knew it. And he preached his funeral. He preached the funeral of the man that he had killed because he wanted his wife. You know, and thank the Lord, he got busted. He got thrown in prison. But why would a preacher do that? He started coveting. 
He got he gave himself over to covetousness, and sure enough, he ended up being a murderer and is, and is in uh, is in prison today. And so we need to understand that this it can it can ruin us. It can change us. You might be a nice person now. You get caught up in covetousness. It will change you. But the things you know the things that we covet after many times, you know the things. Well, turn over to Luke chapter twelve. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Luke chapter twelve, and verse thirteen. It says, and one of the companies said to them, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say unto my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So right here we see in the story, you got Emmanuel, he's in a dispute. He's wanting something that's not his. And Jesus is like, oh, you know, who, who made me the judge over you? Why are we getting so caught up in things? Because, you know, accumulating possessions, it's nothing. It's unfulfilling and it's a waste of time. This man we see in the, after he gives that parable, after he's been talking to a couple guys who are being selfish, who are being greedy, he tells the story of a man who accumulated all this wealth, but then he died and it didn't do him any good. He couldn't take it with him. Don't waste your time accumulating possessions on this earth. Jesus said, lay up treasures in heaven. He's, and the, the things that blow our mind on earth, those cars, the boats, the houses, the things that we get all blown away by are nothing to God. So why would we waste our time with them? Luke 16, verse 13 says, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, and else he will hold the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. What's he talking about there? Those houses, you know, those cars, those things that people highly esteem, those clothes that, you know, impress everybody, you know, those thousand dollar purses that women want to carry around, you know, that jewelry, that stuff that blows our mind. It's just, it's an abomination in the eyes of God. It's nothing. So why would we get all caught up in, in that stuff? Why would we waste our life going after those things when they're an abomination to God? He doesn't, he doesn't think nothing of them. But you know what? It is it's a serious thing that people are getting caught up in and covetousness is something that should get you thrown out of a church. What? We throw people out of church? If there, there's certain things, if you do, you're supposed to get thrown out of church. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 9. I wrote unto you in, this, in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must he needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company, if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such a one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judges. You know what the people in the world are doing? None of our business. There's a lot of railers and drunkards and extortioners and covetous. They're all over out there. They might even, and they can come in here and they can visit us. Okay? Because we want to preach to them, we want to give them the gospel. But they're not going to be a member of this church if they're in these sins. The Bible said, you know, we're not going to break bread with those people. We're not going to have that Christian fellowship. Those people are going to be seen as lost. They might be saved. The Bible says if any man that is called a brother, someone who are calling brother in this church, someone who are calling sister in this church, if they're doing some of these things, the Bible says they're not supposed to be here. We are supposed to judge within. God has told us to do that. No, judge not. That, you know, that's, I don't want to get me on that subject. Once again, people like to use that all the time. 
But no, that's pronouncing judgment, you know, pronouncing condemnation. There are things that God told us to judge. And God has told us to judge those within the church. Ephesians 5, 3 says, But fornication, all uncleanness, or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. There are some things that just, they're not supposed to be going on amongst God's people. And covetousness is one of those. And covetousness and idolatry. Okay, it says in, oh, I lost the spot. Oh, oh here it is, Colossians 3, 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. How is covetousness idolatry? Well, the truth is they go hand in hand because idolatry is, is giving undeserved attention and service to things that are nothing. Okay, It's not just bowing down to an idol, but when you give all your time and attention to things, when you go against the law of God to accumulate things, that, folks, is idolatry. And that is a very, that is a very serious sin. And the, you know, the place of pri God ought to get, have a place of priority in our life. Jesus Christ is the preeminent one. And so real quickly, this is a message. This is only going to take a couple minutes. Where most Christians today are struggling with covetousness, I believe it is that they are coveting after the lifestyle of the world. Look at what it says in 2, Corinth or 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not and their damnation slumbereth not. You know how false doctrine is getting brought into the church? Do you know why we have these rock and roll churches, these contemporary churches all over? Do you know why people fell for that stuff? Do you know why people fall for false doctrine all the time? Because these false prophets, they're smart. And they use covetousness to bring it in. What does that mean? Well, listen, folks, we're made out of the same flesh that the world's made out of. The things that the world is doing, our flesh is going to want to do those things. Our flesh is going to want their entertainment. Our flesh is going to want a lot of the things that they have. But you know what? We have been bought with a price. We are to glorify God and our body. And that life that the world lives, folks, that's not ours. That is not for us. We can't have that. For us to desire that type of life is wrong. That's covetousness. We can't have that. We can't have what they have. But you know what? They can't have what we have. I think what we have is better. But these false prophets, they come in. Man, look at how much fun the world has at these rock concerts. You know, look at, look at, all, look at all that fun that's going on. You know what? There's no reason you can't have that too. All right, you know, let's have the entertainment. You know, let, let, let's bring it in. And they do. They appeal to your flesh. And people buy in all the time. Why? Because I want what the world has. I don't, I don't like being different. I don't like the stigma that comes with it. You know, I, I, just want, I just want to fit in. Why? We don't belong in the world. We are not of this world. We are strangers and pilgrims. We can't have what they have. And to desire it is covetousness. And, the, and Christians, they are coveting after the lifestyle of the worldly. They want to look like the world. They want to fit in. And they're getting caught up in all the same foolishness. And they just want to live for today's pleasures. And there's plenty of preachers out there that will tell you how you can do that. And you know what? They use covetousness and it's bringing in damnable heresies and it's destroying Christians. And you know what? Christians, we wouldn't have a problem at all with covetousness if we would just live by faith. If we would stop being so earthly minded. If you would really believe that we have treasures in heaven for serving Christ. If you really believe that, why would you waste your time accumulating temporary earthly things. Why don't we just trust God and claim Hebrews 13, 5? Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. 
So be content. You know, lay up treasures in heaven. If you believe that, you're not going to waste your time on temporary things that are going to burn. You know what they say? Nobody's ever seen a hearse dive, driving down the road with a U-Haul behind it. You're not, you're not going to. You're going to leave that stuff behind. Your kids and your grandkids are going to fight over it. Your family's going to get torn apart after you die, and they're all going to hate each other because they're coveting after your stuff. Well, you know what? You teach them a lesson, die poor. You know, so they don't have any inheritance. And then your family can still love each other and, and not be torn apart by covetousness. Well, listen, folks, we, all, we have all broken these Ten Commandments. All of us, in, your, we, we, in one way or another, we have broken all Ten Commandments. And what I hope these messages have proved to everyone is that you're guilty of sin. Even since you've been saved, you have broken these commandments. You reek of sin, folks. You're nothing but filthy sinners still. But thank God we've been saved by His grace that we do not deserve. We don't deserve it for one second. And when a person reads the Ten Commandments, when a lost person reads the Ten Commandments, it ought to make them cry out to God for salvation. And when a saved person reads the Ten Commandments, they ought to thank God for His salvation. And don't get caught up in thinking you're so good and thinking you're so great because you go to church, you know, you don't use swear words, you know, you give some money. You still stink, folks. You're still a dirty, rotten sinner. And so you know what? Why don't we just, why don't we thank God for His grace? And why don't we share that gift of salvation with other people, that free gift? Don't get caught up in that. No, we got to get them living like us if they're really going to go to heaven. Are you serious? We reek. We'd have to get them living exactly like Jesus Christ. We can't even do that. We've been going to church for years. And so why don't we just trust God's word and say, you know what? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And let's go ahead and take the gospel to people and don't get discouraged if they don't become like you overnight after they ask Christ in their heart. You know what? Trust God. If he said, who shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And go ahead and keep on soul and keep on giving the gospel. And just keep on trusting God. And I was like, well, why should I even try keeping these Ten Commandments? We're going to try so we can see if we just can't please God and lay up some treasures in heaven. Not so we can go to heaven. And so I hope these have been a help to you. And I hope after all this, I hope you all went from feeling like, you know what? We're not too bad to feeling like we stink bad. <laughs> Maybe we'll walk out of here with a little humility. Uh, yeah, okay, so we beat the Catholics. Who cares? <laughs> we still deserve to go to hell just like them. If they would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they get saved too. It's not about the lifestyle, folks. This isn't a competition. This isn't, you know, that's, that's not what it is. It's about trusting Christ. And if you are, if you're comparing yourself among other people, you know, the Bible says that's not wise. You're, you're, it, it means nothing. You know, what's, what stinks worse? You know, just, I mean, stink, you know, does Lindberger stink worse? Or, you know, well, you know, just, we all stink, folks. And so I hope you got that. So with that, let's all stand together.